It's good to have our visitors this morning. We're glad that you are with us. Hope that you will stay after our worship, that we might be able to visit with you more. We're going to have Bible classes for all ages, and hope that you will stay and uh, study the Bible further with us. We're here to worship God. We're here to honor and praise and magnify our Creator. That's the purpose of our assembly. We're here to be as priests unto God. Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2 that we are a holy priesthood or a royal priesthood. Every Christian is a priest according to the New Testament. As we're going through the book of Hebrews, we're finding that Jesus Christ is our one and only high priest. Therefore, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, that we have come to Jesus Christ uh, as living stone. He was rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious. The nation of Israel as a whole rejected Christ, but He is the chosen one. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior. And He is the reason why we assemble this morning. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 says, You also, as Peter is talking to Christians, as living stones are being built up, a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We as Christians are living stones. We're part of a spiritual house. That's referring to the church. A spiritual house, the temple, where God dwells. And as the temple, we're not only that, but we're also the priesthood. Not only are we the temple in the New Testament, but the church is also the priesthood of God. He says we are a holy priesthood. And the purpose of a priest is to offer sacrifice. He says we offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. He's the high priest. He's the mediator. So we're here today to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Just as in the Old Testament during the patriarchal period, the patriarchs would offer up sacrifices. During the Mosaic period, under the Levitical system, they would offer up sacrifices. Well, we're not offering up animal sacrifices. We're not offering up grain or oil sacrifices as you find in the Old Testament. We're offering up spiritual sacrifices. We're here to worship God in spirit and in truth as Jesus taught in John 4, 23 and 24. So we assemble together and we sing praises unto God. We assemble together and we pray together as we go to God the Father through Jesus Christ, our mediator. We're hearing the preaching of God's Word. We're going to hear the teaching of God's Word from those who have prepared themselves to teach. That's part of our sacrifice. The Lord's Supper is taken upon the first day of the week in which we remember the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. That's part of our spiritual sacrifice unto God. Our contribution upon the first day of the week as we give, as we have prospered. That is, again, part of our spiritual sacrifice that's acceptable to God. But what if God did not accept it? What if we as priests together, assemble together to offer up these spiritual sacrifices and God turns a deaf ear? Could it be that we could be doing the right things, yet God would not accept those spiritual sacrifices? We're taught in the Old Testament that there is such a, 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 a condition that can happen that we could be going through the motions, doing the right things, and God say, take it away. I don't want to hear it. I will not accept your sacrifices. Turn to Isaiah chapter 1. In Isaiah chapter 1, we're going to pinpoint the problem. We certainly want to be acceptable to God. We certainly want God to accept our sacrifices that we offer to Him. 
So we have to understand that there could be a problem that we're, we're not identifying, and we're going to see that identified in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 20. Isaiah, the prophet of God, is speaking to the Old Testament Israel, and there is a clear message for us today. Let's begin with verse 1. The vision Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, as Ahaz and Hezekiah, uh, the kings of Judah. These are the visions he had during the reign of these kings. Look at what he says, beginning in verse 2. Isaiah 1 and verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. We're seeing the problem at the very beginning. I have children, I have reared them up, but they have rebelled against me. Look at verse 3. The ox knows its owner, the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. So we see here God has children, referring to the children of Israel. He says, I have reared and brought them up. I have given them all these blessings, yet they have rebelled against me. These animals, they know their owner, the donkey knows its crib, but Israel does not know me. Look at verse 4. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquities, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord, they have despised the Holy One of Israel, and they are utterly estranged. You see what's going on here? The problem with Israel is their sin, their wickedness. They're engaged in immoral activities. He says they are laden. That means they're covered with wickedness. They're a sinful nation. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. Look at verse 5. Why will you be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. Verse 6. From the sole of the feet even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but bruises and sores and raw wounds. There are, they are not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. Look at this spiritual condition of the people. They are sick from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet. They're filled with sores. There's no soundness in them, verse 6. They got bruises and sores and raw wounds. Think about that spiritually. He's not talking about their physical condition. He's talking about their soul. Here is their spiritual condition. They're sick from the top to the bottom. They have wounds. They have open sores. And it's immorality. It's sin, not physical injury. Excuse me, look at verse 7. Your country lies desolate, your cities are burned with fire, in your very presence foreigners devour your land. It's desolate as overthrown by foreigners. Verse 8, the daughter of Zion is left like a booth in a vineyard, like a lodge in a cucumber field, like a besieged city, open for attack. It's basically what he's saying. Look at verse 9. If the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors, we should be like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. If we hadn't had just a few survive, we would be utterly destroyed like the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis chapter 19. Now look at what he says in verse 10 and 11. Hear the word of the Lord. Here's God speaking. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Now look at verse 10. God is speaking through Isaiah and He's talking to Israel and He says, you're rulers of Sodom, you're people of Gomorrah. You're just as wicked as those wicked cities I destroyed. That's pretty strong language. You're just like Sodom and Gomorrah, He's saying. Listen to me. Listen to what I'm saying. Now look at verse 11. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? 
I have had enough of your burnt offerings of rams and the fat of your well-fed beast. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or lambs or of goats. They're still assembling together and they're still offering sacrifice. They're still assembling together and they're still worshiping. And notice how God responds to that. He does not say, well, it's good that you're still assembling together and worshiping me. That's a good thing. You've got that going for you. He doesn't say that. Notice what he says. I've had enough of your sacrifices. I've had enough of it. I do not delight in the, bull, the blood of bulls or of lambs and of goats. Now, this is what he commanded In the law of Moses, the book of Leviticus talks about those sacrifices. This is what God commanded for the people to do. Yet the people were trying to offer up holy sacrifices without holy lives. Their lives weren't holy. Their lives weren't righteous. Yet they would still get together and they would still offer the sacrifices. Look at what God is saying. I've had enough of it. Look at verse 12. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity in the solemn assembly. Look at verse 14. The new moon... And your appointed feast, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. You come to the temple, you trample my courts, you offer all of these things, you're going through the new moon, the Sabbath ceremonies, and I hate it, God says. I hate it. I despise it. They have become weary to me. Look at verse 15. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. You're coming to me, you're still praying, you're still sacrificing, but I'm not going to listen to it anymore. And what was the problem that we've seen from the very beginning of chapter 1? Sin in their life. Sin that they have not let go of. Sin that they refuse to give up. Yet they're still getting together and going through the motions. And God says, stop it. Stop it. Here's what they need to do, verse 16 and 17. Wash yourself, make yourself clean, remove the evil of your deeds from your eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, and plead for the widow's cause. He's telling them they need to repent. He's telling them they need to get their life in line with my will, then I will accept your sacrifices. Then I will accept your worship to me. Now let's put this back into a New Testament perspective as we started the lesson. Churches assemble together upon the first day of the week according to the Word of God. They take the Lord's Supper upon the first day of the week according to the Word of God. They worship in song. They praise God according to the Word of God. They pray according to the Word of God. They listen to the preaching and teaching according to the will of God and they put money in the plate according to the will of God. But to how many would God say, stop it. You're wasting your time. Your sacrifice is vain because you're not living for me. You've got sin and corruption in your life and you're not willing to let it go. That's basically what he's saying. He's saying you have to get your life in line with what you do on Sunday. You know, sometimes we can sing a better religion than we actually live. You ever sang the song, All to Jesus I Surrender, but yet we don't. Yet we don't, do we? 
We talk about Jesus as Lord. We'll pray and, uh, and we'll, we'll sing songs. We talk about Christ as Lord. But during the week, we live the very opposite of what we sing and pray on Sunday. And so God is saying through the prophet Isaiah, and we learn from the Old Testament, Psalm, or excuse me, Romans 15 and verse 4, that we are to take instruction from the Old Testament and learn from it and put it into practice within a New Testament context. If we're going to be the priest of God, we have to understand that we have to have a holy life before we get here on Sunday morning. If we wish to, to have our worship acceptable to God. Remember the scripture, 1 Peter 2 and verse 5. We are a holy priesthood. That means a life that's set apart Monday through Saturday so we can assemble together and worship God with these spiritual sacrifices on Sunday. A holy priesthood. And holiness never takes a vacation. Holiness never takes a break. We must be a holy people always. So back to Isaiah chapter 1, he says you've got to wash yourself, you've got to clean yourself up, and he's basically saying there, verse 16 and 17, you've got to repent. You've got to repent and come to me, and I'll clean you up. If a parent has a child, and that child is wallowing in the mud, there's a mud puddle out there, they're playing in the mud. The parent wants to clean up the child, but as long as the child stays in the mud, the, the parent can't clean the child up. As long as the child is staying in the mud, the parents say, come out, I'll clean you up. But you can't be cleaned up while you stay in the mud. And so many Christians, they want to be cleansed, they want to be pure in the sight of God, but they still want to stay in the mud. They're not going to get out of the mud of sin they're in. It doesn't work that way. We have to repent. We have to cease to do evil. We have to learn to do good that's bearing fruit unto God. Seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, and plead the widow's cause. Now look at the love and the tender mercy of God in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. He's saying, if you do this, you come back to me, you get out of the mud, I'll clean you up. I'll clean you up. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though you are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. I will cleanse you. I will purify you. Then you can come before me with your sacrifices, and I will accept them. But you cannot do that if you remain in the mud. And so we see here God is saying, I will cleanse you. Let's reason together. We understand that perfectly, even more so in the New Testament, when we talk about the blood of Christ. It's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us. Revelation 1 and verse 5. We understand it's the blood of Christ that redeems us. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Ephesians 1 and verse 7. It is that blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us, but we have to repent. We have to get out of the mud to get cleaned up. Look at verse 19. Isaiah 1 and verse 19. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the lamb, but if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten or devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Here are your options, God is saying. I want to cleanse you. I want you to, I want you to be pure in my sight, but you've got to come to me on my terms. If you're willing and obedient. New Testament summarizes that with one word, faith. Faith that obeys the will of God. Willing and obedient to do God's will, you will be blessed. You will eat the good of the land. I will give you these blessings. I will clean you up. I will purify you so that you can worship me acceptably. So that we can be together forever in heaven. But you've got to come to me on my terms, God is saying. We have to be willing. We have to be obedient to God's will. God will cleanse us then, verse 20. But if we refuse and rebel, we face judgment. We face wrath. 
Those are the only two options. That's true of the Old Testament. That's true of the New Testament. We believe, we obey, we're blessed. If we disobey, we will face God's wrath. And therefore, as we think about this lesson and we draw this lesson to a close, we need to think very seriously about how we worship God. Holiness is not just a Sunday activity. Holiness is living before God and righteousness every day of the week. Living before God as a people that are a holy priest, people who are seeking to do the will of God, seeking to please Him when we're with our co workers, our classmates, and recreation, friends, family. Always. And God says, if you do that, the blood of Christ will cleanse you, 1 John chapter 1, and you can accept, and I, or excuse me, I will accept your sacrifices made to me. And that's what we have to understand. That our worship must match our life, and our life must match our worship. Perhaps you are in the mud of sin this morning and you're not in a pleasing relationship with God. You need to become a Christian. Remember, God says, I'll cleanse you. I'll purify you. But you have to be willing and obedient. If you believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, you're willing to make that confession, willing to repent of your sins. And I have told Saul, why are you waiting? Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins Calling on the name of the Lord, Acts 22 and verse 16. The blood of Christ and the waters of baptism will purify you. Not the water, the blood. The blood purifies in water baptism. And we can be the people of God clean. Perhaps we've departed, we've gone off. We're like Israel in Isaiah chapter 1. We're still going through the motions. However, we're not worshiping as we ought. We're performing the sacrifices on Sunday But God is saying, I don't want to hear it. Not until you repent and come back to me. And if you come back to him, he will cleanse, he will purify, he will make new again that relationship. The choice is yours while we stand and sing.